Now we all keep about three types of tools in our workshops. Wrenches, screwdrivers, sockets. They only need recharge when we need to stop working. We're too tired, we eat a little bit of food, we go back to work. They'll last for generations. The next type of tool we have is the electric tool. They're powered off batteries. They only need to be stopped working when they need to be recharged. Or in the case of wall-powered units, only when they need to cool down. They can wall-powered units can be powered off a generator, a large extension cord, or a power converter hooked up to our car's battery. Now there's the last type of air tools, which we normally leave in our air shop because we don't think we can take them out, our pneumatic tools. Air nailers, air grinders, impact wrenches, air scalers, air polishers, air files, nibblers, cutters, slicers. There's untold numbers of different types of air tools, but we have to leave them in our shops because we don't have a way of powering them outside of it. Now, with an onboard air system, we do. I'll be explaining how to install, in my case, a Mopar RB2 AC compressor reappropriated as an air system. This, in the end, will allow you, when you're finished, will allow you to power an air nailer if you need to, and then use an air cutter if you need to cut those nails off. system is something that everyone at Instructables or Make can use to help them build great projects. In a few minutes I'll show you how I built it. No matter what type of air compressor you decide to use, all other components that I'll explain will be applicable in its installation. As you can see, I installed the cast iron RB2 compressor. From that compressor's output flange, we go to a oil air separator. This is required because AC compressors expel oil out the output, air output. It will need to be captured and returned to the compressor to allow it to have continued lubrication. A small, a small modification of your air oil separator may be required if it's a newer model. From there, we go through an air line to our manifold. Here we have our most important component, the pop-off safety valve. This valve I'm using is a 150 PSI. Do not use a valve that goes higher because most air fittings and attachments are not rated past 150 PSI. The next most useful part is the air pressure switch. This switch turns on at 145 turns off at 145 PSI and turns on at 110 PSI, allowing the system to cycle if it needs to be dis if it gets below 110 PSI, it turns the system back on, recharging it. If it goes to 145 PSI, it turns it off before the system becomes dangerous. From here, we see two quick disconnects, an industrial for my air tools and a universal if I'm ever using some of my friends because they use automotive or manufacturing type um, air fittings on their air hoses. From there, we see a 180 PSI dowel gauge. This is a panel mount one. Right next to this we see a small control box. This is for the onboard welder system I just recently installed. As you can see here, a negative and positive Miller weld panel connector, a 30 amp toggle switch, the alternator which I've reappropriated as a welding unit, in this case a CS144 Delco, the cables going to the weld connectors, and the diode pack. The CS144 series alternators use avalanche diodes, which means they burn out at 32 volts. To use a CS144 or any of the other CS alternators, you require a diode pack, which is non-avalanche. In this case, I use the diode pack from a Ford 1G large case alternator. These are good for about 180 amps before burnout. 
to install this, we have to open up the alternator, move its original diode pack, a control circuitry, install a rotor control wire, which is hooked up to the brush holder, and connect the stated windings, the three phases, in this case a delta, to the terminals of the rectifier pack. Tools I've used in the instructable. In the back you can see a 40 amp plasma cutter. This is a Chinese copy of an ESAB plasma cutter. It works decently for its price and cost. A Harbor Freight air grinder. A another Harbor Freight angle grinder. Some decent cobalt drill bits with a split point. Try to find a split point cobalt drill set. It doesn't really matter the brand as long as they're not well, Chinese made, like a shop house brand. Um, open end crescent wrenches, adjustable wrench, wire strippers. A long pair of needle nose pliers will get you out of a lot of tough situations if you drop a bolt into a crowd that's in your engine. Ratcheting crescent wrench will take you places. They're always good to have a couple, like 916s, half inch, 3 eighths. They're always good to have just a couple because you can fit them on metric bolts as well. Miscellaneous screwdrivers, Phillips head, flathead, and onto sockets, the thing we're going to be using the most. The sockets you're going to be probably using for the RV2, if you use it, are going to be half inch, 3 eighths, 916s, 7 sixteenths, and 5 eighths. Going into a bit more about sockets, it's always good to have a couple sets around. I have my good set, which is Craftsman, which I keep locked in the bottom drawer of my toolbox. And I have my cheap sets, which are Harbor Freight. As you all know, sooner or later someone will come over if you have a lot of tools and ask to borrow some. And some of, their, some of the sockets that he borrows will end up permanently in his toolbox, even if he doesn't mean to. So, lend them the sockets that didn't cost all that much and keep your craftsmen for yourself. That goes with pretty much any tool if it's a decent brand. Keep your sockets, wrenches, screwdrivers, if they're craftsmen, snap on, any good tool, keep that hidden and let your friends borrow the cheap ones. Now that I've explained most of the tools, Now that you decide to put an air compressor on your vehicle, there's four ways of doing it. An electric air compressor. Electric compressors are easy to install, but they have limited air output and limited run time. The second option is to use your vehicle's air conditioning compressor, which is most likely a sanding type. That will require an oiler to be put on the air intake to keep the pistons inside oiled. If it ever runs out of oil, it will freeze and be pretty much totally destroyed. Also with sandins, you don't have the ability to produce much air. But there is one good feature, it's stock. But there's another bad feature, you lose air conditioning if you use it. Now, if you want air conditioning and don't want to install an, air, an electric air compressor, you can use a belt driven compressor. Right here is a York 210. I removed this from an old Ford car. The 210 is the compressor you usually want. It's the one that most people use for their builds. It has usually a V-belt clutch. You can replace that with a serpentine for easier installation. And it could be mounted upright or at an angle. The 210 is usually the easiest air compressor to find. You can get them on eBay or from your local junkyard for about 30 bucks. Now, because I couldn't find the 210 when I originally started finding all the components for this build, I used a Mopar RV2 compressor. It's a cast iron dual V. I believe this one, the RV2, has a much higher air output than the 210, simply because the pistons on the RV2 are significantly larger. It's also cast iron, which I believe will allow it to dissipate more heat easier easier and give it a longer runtime.